We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Uh, my name is Daniel and I'll be acting as the online moderator for this session with some very much needed help from uh, fellow research colleagues, Carlotta and Sophie. Uh, alongside Dr. Mueller, here uh, both there sitting at the AGF venue, the four of us will try to make sure this session runs as smooth as possible. Uh, so this session we are having today adds up on a number of themes. Jamal Shaheen, here present in our online session, and his team at the United Nations University have been treating in three events that were held uh, during last month under the title of Furthering uh, Digital Sovereignty Debates. Uh, of course, the Internet Governance Project is no stranger to these uh, themes, and both, both Professor Mueller and the group at large have produced their fair share of timely analysis on the, I might say, uh, always uh, controversial topic of digital sovereignty. So, um, well, for those of us uh, hoping in into the session without prior knowledge of the format we'll be using, or that didn't uh, found time to read the description, we uploaded into the IGF page. Well, let me tell you about some very simple rules. So, well, um, first of all, um, we are trying to hear as many voices and different perspectives as we can. So intervention, interventions should come as streamlined as possible. You might have noticed that there's a timer lying around there, right? Um, in one of the Zoom windows set on two minutes. Well, that's the maximum time we'll be allowing speakers to voice their ideas, right? So if any of you go beyond those two minutes, um, I'll ring a bell in, in my mobile phone and make a, a um, um, small sound so, so you all will know that um, uh, these two minutes have passed. Um, let's hope I don't get to do that. <laughs> so, well, Dr. Mueller uh, will kickstart the conversation and once he does, you are all encouraged to participate, uh, voicing your ideas on the topics we are covering. To do so, if you are on the IGF venue, make some sort of signal to Dr. Mueller so he knows you want to participate. Or if you are following this event by Zoom, hit the uh, raise hand button uh, you have uh, available in the app. Um, so the uh, thing is, um, we'll keep track of who wants to enter the conversation at all times. And uh, hopefully um, all people or almost all people get to say uh, out loud what they think. So um, since we really, really like uh, to hear uh, what you all uh, have to say, we'll give precedence to new speakers. This means that uh, if you've just voiced your ideas and there's people waiting to voice theirs, uh, you will have to wait. Uh, I don't know, know for how long, uh, but you'll have to wait. Uh, it will all depend on how many new speakers want to enter the conversation, all right? So lastly, let me tell you that every now and then we we'll introduce a poll linked to uh, what we think is an especially interesting topic. We encourage you all to answer these polls since we think they'll give us uh, some very useful insights on the key topics we are covering today. And um, so uh, to answer to them, uh, Carlota, uh, if you are there, please, would you share your screen with the Mentimeter page, if this is possible? Yeah, great. So, um, um, well, um, great, thanks. So um, as I was saying, uh, to answer to them, you must scan a QR code that will show up um, at some point so in, in, in my, um, and in, uh, when we introduce the first poll and or follow a link 
to um, uh, menti.com, um, the page in which uh, we will be um, hosting this um, and this um, the, these polls. Um, and well, I'm passing the or, uh, the URL. Uh, you should all follow on the Zoom chat. And uh, so let me. You should enter to this this page right here and uh, wait um, for uh, a code to show up when we introduce the, the first poll. I'll rem um, I'll recall everything that I'm that I'm saying right now. I'll, I'll remember about this. So. Um, I encourage um, everybody to enter to the page to menti.com right now, uh, be it on your computer uh, browser or on your phones. Uh, that way you'll be able to answer the polls when they uh, show up. And um, so every poll is linked to a code, as, uh, as I was saying, and um, it, you'll be seeing that code on your screens and a QR code also, as I was, as I was saying, uh, that you can scan and then enter to answer each and every poll. And uh, well, we'll give you around 10 minutes to answer them. And uh, then Carlota will show you the results. Um, as I was saying, I'll remind you of all this when we launch the first poll, right? So that's all for me. So I think we are ready to start now. Uh, if anyone has any question, please put it in the chat in Zoom. So Milton, uh, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thanks so much for your role in uh, helping us put together this uh, and to Jamal and uh, the crew at uh, CRU, UN University also. Um, so I'm gonna start with a very uh, forthright statement about the issue of sovereignty. And again, this is just to get the dialogue started. So I'm really staking out a very strong position. So let me just begin. So sovereignty is actually a well understood concept in political science and international relations. The theory underlying it has been developed and discussed uh, since the 16th century. From a practical standpoint, uh, sovereignty has played a central role in the practice of international law, politics and diplomacy for the last two centuries. So from this elaborate long term discourse, a commonly accepted definition emerges. Sovereignty means that the state is the supreme and exclusive authority in a territory. It is subject to no internal competitors and no unwanted external political influences. So what does digital sovereignty mean? Well, I'm going to argue that it means essentially three things for the digital world. Number one, it means the power to erect borders that protect the state from incoming information. Number two, it means trade protectionism in the digital sector, that is in digital information services and equipment. And three, it means enhanced state power over user data. That is to say the online accounts, the actual data records and the PII of its citizens. So all of these aspects of digital sovereignty take the well-established concept of sovereignty and apply it to cyberspace for better or worse. That is to say it territorializes information flows and it borders national ICT markets, whether for services or goods. So one of the big problems with the concept of digital sovereignty is that it has become badly confused with an individual's right to self-determination. And this confusion is something we must avoid. State sovereignty is completely different from, and actually in many ways opposed to, an individual right to digital self-determination. As a simple example, for example, if the European government decides what cloud provider you must use in the name of digital sovereignty program, it undermines the individual's ability to choose their cloud provider for themselves. So my goal here today is to, number one, put an end to the confusion around the concept, uh, and particularly this confusion of the state-based concept of sovereignty, which is well-established and grounded in international relations, and this uh, concept of individual self-determination, which is a completely different thing. 
The digital sovereignty means a bordered digital economy and a fragmented internet. If we want a true model of digital sovereignty, we can look to China, which is implementing it consistently. So I'll end there and uh, look forward to other people participating in the town hall. So, yeah, if anyone wants to follow up from where Milton left off? Anyone wants to jump in? We see that some um, many hands being raised. So um, maybe well, I'm seeing that uh, Andrew Compling wants to uh, jump in. So yeah, Andrew, please. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Nicholas. Yeah, go ahead, whenever you want. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, well, Professor Peishi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah this is uh, Professor Xu from Communication I University know. of China. All right, so go ahead, please. Uh, I'm not very familiar with uh, this uh, fishbowl, by the way, so you have to interrupt me if there's any misfollowing uh, of your, the role. And uh, so I'm uh, somehow... Uh, uh, the interpreting a kind of Chinese perspective about the digital sovereignty. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are three layers uh, in terms of cyber sovereignty or digital sovereignty in China. And the first layer is that uh, the sovereignty in the digital domain, it was understood from the perspective of content or information. Milton has said that uh, it is about the protection from the incoming information. And uh, of course, uh, there, there was a period of time, for example, that uh, the Chinese and the Chinese media were memorizing September 11th, and they were not memorizing uh, September 18th when the Chinese was attacked. So there's a kind of uh, information was understood as a kind of a domination somehow. After that, uh, it was understood in terms of the infrastructure security. So that was between 2013. Uh, that was after 2013, after Snowden leaks. So China has somehow reorganized the different institutions and, uh, to, uh, and start to understood uh, uh, sovereignty from kind of infrastructure security perspective. And thirdly, from 2019 uh, onwards, uh, sovereignty was understood in terms of digital economy. So that is a very much kind of European uh, kind of concept. It happened in 2019 when the 2019 IGF was held in Germany, by the way. So in that case, China has a kind of American body uh, that was a market driven in terms of uh, digital economy, but it has a kind of a European head or mind that uh, is exercising, who is exercising very heavy handed regulations towards the digital economy. So that is a more or less state uh, kind of intervention. So now we have a kind of mixture of everything. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Professor Shu. Um... You you just use uh, some more seconds than than past two minutes. So all right, thank you, thanks a lot. So I'm saying that uh, maybe um, Andrew wants to jump in. Yeah, hi there. Hopefully uh, you can hear me okay, Daniel. Um, I'll be really brief, just sort of picking up on uh, uh, the, the point that uh, uh, Milpin made. Uh, uh, in my view, uh, digital sovereignty um, is uh, absolutely essential um, as a mechanism to uh, uh, really recognise that if I look across the sort of different regions globally, uh, there are completely different priorities, different values and different perspectives between 
uh, certainly uh, states, if not if uh, uh, or regions. Um, so, uh, in, in my view, digital sovereignty is absolutely essential to protect uh, to, or to assert protections such as GDPR from a European uh, perspective, and dare I say it, to mitigate the harms caused by the broken uh, US uh, regulatory framework, um, which uh, uh, it, which I think it is really a root cause of many of the problems um, and harms that, that uh, uh, we're witnessing currently. Um, and if that means that uh, some form of so-called splinter net um, uh, happens, then so be it. Um, you know, uh, a network of, of networks operating under different rules and frameworks seems perfectly reasonable to me um, if it means that uh, the nations or regions can assert um, the, the the protections that they deem to be appropriate um, to their citizens. Um, and, and just really to finish off as an example, if I again think about GDPR, um, I lose GDPR effectively if I store any of my data uh, with a US uh, a corporation uh, because of the US Cloud Act and FISA 702. Uh, which, which basically means that there's a warrantless ac access to my personal data uh, if I'm a, if I'm not a U.S. citizen and, and not not thought to reside in in the U.S., so uh, I think that's unacceptable. So uh, uh, let bring on digital sovereignty will be my uh, call to action. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Andrew. Uh, you expected like uh, exactly the time you had to make your statement, and I must say that it's a bold statement that. I think it's gonna um, get some responses from all uh, kinds of uh, participants in the audience. So um, yeah, um, release uh, Chris, if, uh, if you may. Sure, hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come in well. First of all, I wanna agree with Milton. I think it's really useful um, to have this much more, um, formal and, and precise definition of what sovereignty is. I think it's a, a term that's thrown around an awful lot. So we had a session yesterday that was organized by the Dutch IGF talking about digital autonomy. And I wanted to, well, part of what was discussed there was that the idea of autonomy as something larger than sovereignty that, that includes more than just sort of rule of law and state, um, state control. And so I guess what I wanted to put forward was this idea of perhaps autonomy being um, um, something to mitigate the need for sovereignty. So if there is a sort of multi-stakeholder um, effort to create or give autonomy to states um, without the need for regulation or legal frameworks, that's something that can be um, useful and helpful to the goal of a, a sort of global network of networks. Um, but I, I'm not sure if, I'd be curious to know if that's sort of a perspective that makes sense um, in your understanding of the issue, Milton. So thanks a lot. Um, maybe we can go back to Milton for a minute now, and then we'll, um, we'll let Alexander say what he is uh, thinking. So maybe Milton, you want to jump in again? Yeah, why don't we go ahead with Alexander and uh, I'll come in after him. All right, so Alexander, please tell us. Then uh, we'll... Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add something to definition of sovereignty, which, gave, which was given by Milton, mm -hmm. because modern countries are not very democratic, uh, Things that sovereignty is possibility to control what their citizens could consume in information space and what could they produce in information space. And uh, digital sovereignty of countries like Russia, uh, it's not about uh, commercial services or hosting providers, it's about information flow. And actually the more uh, country speaks about uh, digital sovereignty, the less it's a democratic country, because you've seen yesterday, like Chris mentioned, uh, Netherlands people 
uh, discussed uh, autonomy, not sovereignty. And uh, I would like just to mention that some countries understand sovereignty as a control of information flow for their citizens, not commercial services. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alexander and Milton. If you have an answer to some of the statements that have been made, please. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, so I think the, the point Alexander made was very important. The concept of sovereignty refers to the authority of the state. And it doesn't matter whether the state is a democratic one or a liberal democracy or an authoritarian country, the sovereign right, the right of supreme authority and exclusivity uh, is essential to the concept. So an authoritarian state can use the power of sovereignty to <clears throat> exclude and oppress <clears throat> as much as it can, uh, as Andrew uh, sort of fantasizes, um, that it can use it to uh, uh, to uphold rights. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I, th I think that's the important point that um, insofar as Andrew makes a valid point about uh, better protection of individual rights to privacy, uh, this is something that can happen without a um, notion of sovereignty being in the way. So for example, GDPR is extremely unsovereign in the sense that it is extraterritorial in its application. And uh, the, the EU used the leverage of the globalized market to essentially extend some of that data protection uh, out of its own jurisdiction and into many places uh, around the world. It also acted as a model for global protection of privacy that other jurisdictions began to imitate. So I think there's, there's no valid connection between the idea of protecting individual rights and sovereignty per se. Uh, in fact, as, as Alexander makes clear, you can um, undermine individual rights by means of uh, assertions of sovereignty. And that is in fact, one of the main reasons why some of these states assert sovereignty is so that they have more control over the individual's information. So thanks a lot, Milton. Um, maybe we um, we have some uh, sort of answer from Andrew, since I'm seeing that no one else wants to speak right now. Maybe Andrew wants to say something. I don't know. Oh, I'll chime in, uh, Daniel, in the interest of. Uh keeping the uh, d discussion flowing. Um, uh, I, I disagree with uh, with, with Milton um, uh, about uh, the sort of GDPR um, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it's about protecting the personal data of citizens from uh, either the EU or indeed the UK, which has its own uh, uh, version uh, of, of GDPR. Um, the, the fact that it then applies to um, potentially to uh, organizations not located within the boundaries of those uh, uh, countries is simply to make sure that they respect uh, the, the rule of the law of the countries if, if they're effectively mining the data of the citizens uh, of, of those countries. Um, probably a better example um, to, to dwell on that would be if you're looking at uh, extra jurisdictional reach would be, as I mentioned in, in my earlier comments, uh, 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 instruments like the uh, US Cloud Act, which very overtly try and assert the uh, jurisdiction of the US over data servers anywhere in the world. Um, and, and that's something which I think uh, uh, digital sovereignty can help protect uh, people from uh, potentially. Um, so uh, um, any, anyway, uh, uh, the other brief comment to save me just typing it um, would, would be um, just to pick up on the, uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, digital sovereignty and democracy. I think those are two entirely separate and distinct uh, issues. Uh, an undemocratic state is unlikely to be troubled by concepts like digital sovereignty uh, in asserting the, the will of the state over its citizens. And, and uh, you know, there are other mechanisms that, that need to address that. Um, the, you know, the internet will set you free is an interesting, but perhaps somewhat superficial concept in that regard. But I'll stop there as my time's up. Thank you. So, well, thanks uh, a lot, Andrew. You, uh, thanks for, 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 for your statements. Um, I'll uh, stop the debate for a minute now uh, because I think it's time to introduce the first poll we've prepared. I'm seeing some more um, um, hands raised, uh, but we'll pick up uh, with you. Um, after we um, launch this first poll. So um, yeah, as I told you before, you will have to type the numbers you'll be seeing on your screens on the menti.com page. We'll be sharing it also in the chat or scan the QR code uh, to answer uh, to this first poll. Okay, so um, Carlota will introduce this first poll and uh, uh, she's sharing with us. So. So yeah, I'm seeing it on the screen. So as you see, you have a code right there and showing on your screens. You have to enter it. Carlota is sharing right now uh, the link to the page, all right? And uh, well, as I told you, you have around 10 minutes to answer to this question that says, is digital sovereignty a threat to the internet governance multi-stakeholder model? And you have a yes or no option there. So please be sure to, to answer and we'll see the results. I'm seeing that the QR code is not showing and uh, we had some, some problems there. So yeah, here it is. So maybe you can scan it with your phones, those of you that want to use this option. And the rest, well, you can follow that link you are seeing on the chat right now. And, uh, well, use uh, the code that, um, that what was shown and um, that maybe Carlota can, um, can show us again. Well, I'm seeing that the code is uh, 18549498. You can enter that on menti.com. And uh, yeah, we'll see the results in, in a bit. So um, not to list, uh, more time, I saw that a couple of uh, people were raising their hands. Uh, the first one I you... was, uh, it was Jamal, right? Daniel, I think just, we have two people here uh, on the floor who would like to speak, so. Uh... Yeah, so... I, I, I cede my place to willing speakers first, so. Uh, Perfect. So maybe we can uh, go on with one of the speakers that's there with Milton in, in Poland. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, so uh, first the gentleman, Jose, and then Anna. All right, all right, the names, perfect. So go on whenever you want, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, back to Mr. Milton's bright point at the beginning uh, to distinguish between uh, uh, sovereignty and individual uh, rights and determinism. I, I think uh, one of the roots we see uh, in the, like uh, emphasis on digital sovereignty is a state they are representative are, or they are considered to be rep of their individual, their citizens, right? a French citizen has a different, completely different understanding of his or her rights than a Chinese citizen. Maybe that's one of the roots of a different point of views on digital sovereignty. Uh, I think it is very good to distinguish these two concepts, but we cannot separate them completely. Uh, one of the other uh, aspects we should consider, maybe I'm here today in this nice panel to hear about it, is the, what is the relationship between the uh, platform sovereignty and state sovereignty? Why I'm using the 
um, word of sovereignty for platforms? Because I, I, I see that some reactions across the world, like Chinese reaction, European reaction uh, to uh, sovereignty comes from their reaction to American platforms, the big platforms. Uh, let me just, uh, in, uh, I have a limited time, uh, quite briefly, I think the uh, understanding of the data on data ownership is totally different in western east of the Atlantic Ocean. In American culture, any business, any big platform which develops the service, it is considered to be the owner of data. In European culture, they consider it for the citizens, so they give them the right to be forgotten. But in Chinese culture, it's, uh, for, it's considered for the state and government. And I think without talking of the data ownership, we cannot talk about the sovereignty and we are talking about different concepts with the same word. Thank you. So thanks a lot. I think uh, we will go and with uh, Jamal. Then we will go with uh, the second person that's there in the IGF venue, and I think that then we had um, Mauro Santanillo uh, was raising his hand, so that's noted down, and uh, we will go then uh, to him and speak. Uh, please, Daniel, maybe maybe best to go to Mauro first, and then the other person in the room. All right, and then I'll, and then I'll... as you wish, if you prefer to wait. Yeah, please, Mauro. I want to hear what Mauro had to say, and then Professor Zhu also had his hand raised, so we'll. Perfect. Well. So, Mauro, uh, please. Uh... Yeah. Thank you, Jamal, and thank you all for organizing this very interesting town hall. So I will say a couple of things very shortly. The first one that is that we do not have just the idea of sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty as uh, the modern sovereignty, as it was uh, uh, depicted and described by Professor Mueller. We have also had uh, some forms of sovereignty, which are more fragmented, more uh, shared and overlapping each other, and always ever um, bargaining their own space to, 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 to be. This is the, the, the type of sovereignty that uh, uh, characterized the feudal systems, for example, which is very similar to the, uh, the, the transnational internet governance. And the second thing is that I think that we should also distinguish between digital sovereignty and digital sovereigntyism. And I think that the European case uh, clearly showed that we can have a digital sovereignty which is not uh, sovereignties and even against sovereigntyism. And uh, I think that the main point is that for the European, from the European perspective, digital sovereignty is not just an end, but it is a means to achieve a sort of, uh, how to say, um, a protection of fundamental rights uh, for uh, its own citizens. And uh, while in the case of the Russian government and the Chinese government, as they have been uh, talking about sovereignty for at least two decades in the internet governance field, it is more like uh, an end per se, uh, a sort of legitimation of their own uh, power and authority over the, the internet. And about this, I would like to say that I, I'm a bit disappointed by European institutions for picking up this term, digital sovereignty, for their own ends. I would uh, uh, prefer to use the term digital constitutionalism, for example, which this really means that uh, it is going forward a sort of process of constitutionalization of the internet, which sadly the multi-stakeholder governance model uh, was not able to, uh, to achieve. We have still, after so many years, many problems about the protection of users' rights, not to say uh, citizens' rights. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mauro. Um, I think we will go now to the other person that uh, wanted to speak at the AGF venue, please. Uh, with us. Yeah, thanks. Hello, thank you very much for the possibility to ask a question. Um, as, you, as far as you know, uh, any company, including big tech companies, uh, are under the rules of those countries where they are incorporated. So, uh, first of all, they should obey rules of those countries where they are incorporated. 
But nowadays we uh, see a lot of examples of laws or bills, uh, for example, on life safety bills in United Kingdom and in Australia, um, digital service acts, uh, which uh, stated some rules for all companies, uh, and it doesn't depend where they incorporated. And uh, how this uh, process uh, are corresponded to the idea of sovereignty. For example, if we open their uh, digital service acts, we found a lot of demands to any, any company uh, who provide uh, online services. And um, it doesn't matter uh, where they're incorporated. Thank you for the answer. So thanks a lot. Um, um, I think that uh, maybe Professor Chu wants to answer now because he had his hands hand raised, and then maybe Alexander, if there's no one else in the IGF Benning that that wants to uh, say something. So please. There's one more here on the floor who can get in, I guess, after Alexander. Perfect. We'll do that. Yeah. Right. So, Professor Chu, whenever. You yeah. Need. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, a quick follow-up. Uh, our first audience member asked, uh, proposed something like a platform sovereignty. I think that belongs to another thread of discussion uh, between the market and the state. I think Milton mentioned mainly about the state authority. In that case, I think I agree with Milton very much that we have to treat all the governments equally and they uh, are the threats to the multi-stakeholder shape and also a lot of other things because let's say China has this data security law and regulations which somehow are a copy of the EU uh, kind of uh, legalization process. And the US has a very heavy military industry that is uh, basically based on uh, producing hostility and uh, discovering or setting up enemies. So that is a version of uh, military, let's say, version of sovereignty. And uh, of course, Russia has the sovereignty. So we have to treat this uh, kind of uh, uh, actions by the governments on an equal footing. And also, by the way, there's a kind of an uh, I heard that uh, alliance on the future of the internet governance, again, that is a kind of action taken by the state uh, from the United States to EU, which is a threat, by the way, to the mighty stakeholdership represented by IETF and uh, ISO called ICANN. So I agree with Milton in his saying that uh, we treat all the governments as kind of threats of the, of the cyber or Tito Domain, thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Chu. And I think it will be the right time um, um, to show the results of the first poll, maybe, and then time to answer the second. Obviously, then we will go on, as, um, as, uh, as I, was, um, I was saying before, then we'll We'll, we'll see the results of this first poll. So, uh, yeah, it wins the yes. So, yeah, 24 uh, people that have answered this poll think that it's, uh, 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 well, that in fact, digital sovereignty is a threat to the internet governance multi stakeholder model. And 15 people think that it's not. So, yeah. It's not um, much of a large difference between these uh, uh, two uh, options. So yeah, thanks uh, a lot, Carlota. And if you could um, like show us the uh, the link for the uh, second poll, maybe. Um, I don't know if it's the same or if it's a different one, but please. Uh, if, if, if you can show us the, the link for the second. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Well, the second question we're having is, are the EU recent actions in pursuit of uh, digital sovereignty 
giving carte blanche to other state actors to pursue their own conceptions of digital sovereignty. You can answer to that and maybe one of the audience members can pick up on that, but well, we can continue the conversation where we left it. So um, yeah, I think that maybe um, Alexander uh, was uh, next in line. You can see the links right now in the chat, in the Zoom chat. Okay. Monster, please. Uh, thank you All very right. much. Uh, I would like to reply uh, to colleague from France uh, about corporations uh, and about uh, cultures. First of all, I think that talking about sovereignty, uh, governments and the states could uh, try to un interpret corporation uh, as another state. I think some European countries by economia are even smaller than Google or Facebook. So uh, if, you, if we start discussion about corporations like about countries, uh, it would be easier for us, maybe. Also, I would like to mention that the hu human rights are universal, they are not dependent on culture. We should not forget this. Uh, I would like to reply to Anna saying that uh, any legislator have right to propose any form of legislation. In Russia, we have a fairy tale uh, when a princess who wanted uh, flowers to spring uh, in January under snow uh, just issued a decree that flowers should spring under snow in December. Uh, and I think that Russian parliamentarians are feeling like they are, uh, they are uh, such princes. Uh, and uh, replying to results of the previous poll, uh, I would like to invite uh, everyone who said that digital sovereignty uh, is not a threat to multi-stakeholder model to join multi-stakeholder discussions in Russia. That would definitely not possible, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And also thanks for um, continuing, continuing linking your thoughts to the results we had on the first poll. Thanks a lot. So um, and maybe I think that uh, Alexander could go next or maybe Jamal. I don't know. Whoever wants to. We had a question from the floor or a comment from the floor. And yes, then, and then I'll uh, no, no, right. intrude. Okay, hi everyone. This is Michał Wrakowski from the Kościuszka Institute of Poland. Um, so I have a comment slash question maybe, um, and forgive me if I will simplify, but the way it seems to me the discussion is basically about who controls the, the direction of digital development within a country and who controls the infrastructure and what is happening with the infrastructure. And uh, the simplest cleavage that we can see is between the state and the private sector. For the last 20 years, we could uh, you know, hear a lot of optimism about the growth and expansion of global internet that would eventually lead to democratization and to the empowerment of the citizens and the civil society versus the state. And we can see that this is not really happening in many parts of the world, and the result is quite the, the opposite, right? So it's the empowerment, the re-establishment re of the state. So it's there is a sort of scramble between the public and the private organizations uh, concerning whom will control what is happening in cyberspace within a given territorial boundaries, and who controls, you know, what is the what are the limits for. Uh, for instance, deployment of digital technologies. So do we allow AI uh, powered face recognition systems to be employed to um, distinguish a certain you know, group of people with certain, certain, let's say, ethnic characteristics or features, right? So it's basically, uh, at the end of the day, it's a question of control. Who controls, who has the right to control and uh, even there, uh, I think one of you mentioned autonomy and, and the discussion on digital autonomy. Autonomy, if you look at the roots of the word, it's, it means to rule, to live by own rules. So it, it's basically the same thing. And uh, so my question would be uh, concerning what Milton said at the beginning, um, you know, what is the what is the alternative that we might have? Because I would fully agree that with the notion that there is a sort of very tangible danger if everyone, every state starts to pursue digital sovereignty, 
basically they what they are after is the control of how digital revolution is is undergoing within their boundaries and uh, you know and also what professor uh, Shu said so i would agree with that you know we have we can have a lot of nice words about uh, um, empowering citizens in the European Union, protecting privacy, that is all very fair. But this is the discussion on digital sovereignty is not about uh, whether we have this set of regulations of the, or the other. We could see a regulatory hurricane in China recently. So the debate is basically about who decides on what is happening and what can happen within the digital, digital boundaries. What, are, what would be the alternative if we do not put the authority into the hands of the state? and we don't want it to reside in the hands of the companies. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so um, maybe Jamal will say something now. I'll, I'll, I'll try and say something that hasn't been said, but um, um, a really interesting discussion so far. Thank you uh, everybody for, for being there and, and for contributing to the debate. Um, it's, uh, I, sorry, um, the last speaker, I don't know your name, sorry. Um, um, and with the mask on, I don't recognize your face either. <laughs> but um, certainly that, that question at the end, I think raised some really important points. And I think Milton also alluded to this in his um, discussion at the beginning where he talked about, you know, sovereignty essentially, uh, okay. Uh, Milton knows I like to put words in his mouth, but um, uh, sovereignty for whom? Right? He said this is about states. Um, one of the things that, um, that's, been, that's come up is why are we using the term sovereignty? Is there a better term for us to use? And I think that the, one of the things that I've been reflecting on is realizing that sovereignty is the one term that we all agree on across the world. Right? It's one of those concepts that everybody can say, okay, we understand what uh, what we mean in terms of sovereignty, the UN is the, the basis for this and so on and so forth. Um, and it basically means leave us alone, don't do what, don't, uh, um, don't um, interfere in what we're doing. That raises problems, I think, because um, we are developing different conceptualizations of the term. Um, and I think that leads to a couple of, uh, of issues where we're using the term in different ways and, and you see private sector actors and you see individuals starting to use this term of sovereignty to describe um, what their role is. And I think that's, that's also part of the problematic. Another issue that I think has come up in some of the discussion points is um, not only the conceptualization of the term, but the coherence of the term. Uh, even within states, I think sometimes we use the discussions in different ways. Uh, we use this concept of sovereignty in, in, in different ways. Sometimes we're talking about one aspect and sometimes we're talking about another. And because my time has run out, just one more point um, that I wanted to raise was this idea of um, the sensitivity of the different people that talk about uh, sovereignty to each other's point of view. I think that sometimes you have um, uh, private sector, sometimes you have technical experts, sometimes you have state actors that are using the concept of sovereignty and maybe not taking the other positions into consideration, trying to understand what does it mean for, right, the NTC uh, to talk about uh, sovereignty um, in that context, in a political context. There we go, that was my two minutes. I hope that leads to more discussion. More hands are raised at least, so that helps. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, thanks a lot, Jamal. Um, um, we'll go to Milton now. Okay, so I, I did want to respond to um, the question about, um, you know, our, it seems like a lot of the digital sovereignty rationalizations are coming from a reaction to the, uh, the size and importance of the generally US-based platforms, although Chinese platforms are also equally sized. Um, and um, I think this, again, is kind of a misconception. We cannot really speak about platforms <clears throat> having sovereignty. They do not have coercive power. They do not come and arrest you. They do not put you in jail. Uh, so generally, if you're using Google, uh, yes, there may be issues related to data protection. Um, but you're pretty much doing it because you want to do it. And um, 
there are issues related again to how you protect your data, how you release your data, but they don't have any anything approaching sovereign authority, and we shouldn't again confuse the dialogue by by talking that way. So the very interesting question that my Polish colleague raised was if if you don't want the states to have power over it and uh, you don't want the corporations to have power over it, what, who does make a decision? And the simple and perhaps somewhat utopian answer to that is that we do have uh, transnational uh, multi-stakeholder internet governance institutions uh, such as the uh, address registries and ICANN and um, potentially certain other forms of uh, uh, arrangements, institutionalized arrangements, which are multi-stakeholder, uh, that uh, do exert uh, do uh, engage in real governance of internet-related resources. And so, obviously, we don't want all local and territorial authority of states to be replaced by these global institutions. But when it comes to the internet, we do want the basic global connectivity and access to be globalized, we do want that to be opened up and not territorialized, at least I want that. I think uh, some people don't agree with me, but, but I think that that is a much better model than, than uh, state sovereignty. And again, I was glad to see that he recognized um, that if every state decides to do its own thing, then you are going to get a fragmented internet. So thanks a lot, Milton. Maybe we have time for um, another participant here. I'm seeing that Andrew is there, but I'm also seeing that uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, Klingwachter uh, is uh, waiting. And maybe be, since he hasn't voiced his uh, ideas yet, maybe he can jump in. That's me. Yeah, yeah, see you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have to apologize. I had a technical problem to access the meeting, so uh, I was late. Uh, what I see part of the confusion is that we mix two different layers. I think in the internet, we have, let's say, the, the borderless space, which is the uh, technical infrastructure, and then the bordered space, uh, places, which is the governance uh, on the internet. So uh, we had over the years always this differentiation uh, on uh, the uh, development of the internet and the use of the internet, the governance of and on the internet. And while uh, we uh, have to accept that these are two interlinked but different processes. So the sovereignty comes with the use of the internet and not with the development of the internet. And in so far, I think it's, uh, for me, a very constructive step forward. If uh, Giran uh, now, as I can see, oh, uses the term technical internet governance, which uh, it manages the, the borderless space, while on the uh, border places, uh, the sovereign equality of states as enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations will continue to be a guidance. That means we have unfragmented internet and we have a fragmented internet on the bigger layer. So these are two concepts which exist in parallel and in a certain interlinkage. And this creates partly the tension and, and also the confusion uh, because we uh, very often mix these two layers and they have to be separated uh, in a theoretical discussion. Practically, I understand this is interlinked. Back to you, thank you very much. So, um... Thanks, thanks a lot. So this, that's really interesting. So maybe I, I don't know, Milton, if we have someone there on the IDF venue that wants to speak. Um, is, is it the case? Because if not, so we are going uh, to Andrew for a minute now, and um, we'll. But if Andrew, if uh, you wait for a minute, so I'm, I think. It's the right time to show the results from our second poll and um, and uh, yeah throw the third because we are like really running out of time here. So <laughs> so yeah, let's see what it says. Well, ten people think that the EU recent actions in pursuit of digital sovereignty is giving or 
giving carte blanche to other state actors to pursue their own conceptions of DS. And uh, yeah, um, and some people, uh, six, uh, said the thing that no. So, well, um, um, if we can see uh, the third poll, maybe, I don't know if, still, if we have time for that, maybe, maybe we will we'll leave that out because we have four minutes and a lot of hands are raised. So, um, yeah, uh, Andrew. Uh, I'll be, I'll be really brief um, and just just say that uh, um, in, in my view, the, the, the status quo is deeply problematic. Um, it's dominated by the tech sector and cyber libertarians. Um, and you know, frankly, they've resisted any meaningful governance by the other stakeholders. Um, so uh, I don't think the, the status quo is defensible. Um, and yes, yes a greater respect for human rights in all nations is important, but undemocratic states have and will continue to make decision, decisions without consideration for the views of others. So I think that's an entirely separate um, the discussion which won't be affected by digital sovereignty. Um, so in my view, no, this shouldn't be a reason for preventing democracies from asserting uh, their rights and protecting uh, their citizens. Um, the alternative is to allow the continuing harms an erosion of the rights uh, of those rights by the tech sector, which, in my view, is totally unacceptable. And I'll stop there. So thanks, Andrew. We will uh, jump now to Team Stevens, and then maybe I am Brown. On um, that's pretty much it. And um, Milton will make his closing remarks. We don't have time for more. So please, Team. Great, thank you. Just very, very briefly, and I know this is picking up on a point that Milton's made repeatedly, which is about, uh, even though, I don't, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Milton, but um, uh, this idea, running through this, uh, this conversation is somehow that sovereignty, the meaning of sovereignty is somehow stable, but it is not, and it has changed many, many times over a very long period of time. And it changes, and, and somebody mentioned earlier how the meanings of sovereignty are different across you know, with across communities, and that's absolutely correct, uh, between states, between uh, uh, various stakeholder groups and so on. But it's also unstable and, and unresolved within those communities. So when China talks about internet slash cyber slash digital sovereignty, those meanings often are put forward as policy statements that are then backfilled through policy processes later. And we can see that in the EU at the moment, where you have ideas about technological sovereignty that simply are not resolved. So when you look at a country like Germany, where you may have half a dozen, six, seven, eight, perhaps, different meanings of those that phrase being contested and discussed in the public sphere, it tells you an awful lot about what this, uh, this, this, this concept of sovereignty is actually doing in political terms, because it, it, it's shifting, it's unstable. And this conversation has, has tended to uh, proceed as if somehow it is fixed, and it is not. And a lot of the conversation around digital sovereignty is trying to work out precisely what it might mean. And it's coming up against some very practical as well as normative uh, obstacles. Um, and I just wanted to park that there because I think that's one of the things that we really need to consider when we have um, further conversations about sovereignty in general. But thanks. Maybe Ian can um, like be really short in what he wants to say and then we'll jump to Milton and we have to close the session because time has run out. Um, yes. Um, uh, like really, really brief. And uh, sure. we'll... <laughs> <laughs> can you can you hear me okay, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for organizing this. It, it's a great event. Clearly, there's a lot more to discuss. The, the two very brief points I wanted to add, one would be, um, Milton, I like this sort of, you know, the very clean, narrow definition that you started with, and I think it's helpful in lots of contexts. But I think, as Tim was just saying, there are many other important notions around sovereignty. One I would add from a European perspective is that it's that the positive obligations of states to protect the human rights of their citizens is very important in Europe, much more than in US conceptions of human rights. And I think that's something that we can't ignore in this context. The more specific security point I wanted to make was, we've seen from, from Snowden's leaks and various other revelations, how difficult it is for states outside effectively the US and China to really have any guarantees about the security of the computing equipment uh, within their borders. And I think that's something else probably that people will have to act collectively at, through their own states to deal with. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Diane. So Milton, time for uh, you to 
wrap up and close this debate, please. Yes, we do really need to wrap up here. There's an, another session, I think, that comes in, and I'm supposed to run off to a, a main session. But um, honestly, in response to Tim, I don't think it's helpful to say, oh, the word sovereignty can have a bunch of different meanings, and the meaning is not stable, and blah, blah, blah. I think that that actually is precisely what we were trying to do the opposite of in this session, which is let's talk about different approaches to policy regarding internet governance, um, but let's not confuse sovereignty and, and have it, you know, six different meanings on the table at the same time. And in the meantime, authoritarian states are exploiting that concept to get what they want out of bordering the internet and fragmenting the internet. Uh, let's not play into that. Let's have a very clear conception of if you're talking about digital sovereignty, this is what you're talking about. You're talking about bordering, you're talking about uh, restricting and territorializing information flows under the control of the state. That's really, there's, there's no way around that. Even the Europeans, you know, uh, their digital sovereignty initiatives are all about things like a European cloud, about uh, subsidies to chip manufacturing, so it will be within their territory. Uh, the Europeans are not talking about censoring incoming information, but when they talk about how much they hate American platforms, they uh, start edging pretty close to that sometimes. So, so let's, let's try to clarify the discussion rather than clouding it and mucking it up with, you know, 16 different definitions of, uh, definitions of sovereignty and, and at least understand if you don't want to adopt my particular definition of sovereignty, which is very historically grounded, uh, at least distinguish the words you are using when you talk about different kinds of sovereignty. Thanks very much, everybody, for participating. It was a great discussion. So thanks a lot, Milton. Um, sadly, we've consumed all the time uh, we had. It would be great if we had unlimited time to keep discussing, but that's not the case. So anyway, I wanted to thank you all for this, I think, really engaging town hall we've had. And uh, I also wanted to tell you that Jamal and his team will be releasing a report on the discussion we've just had. Uh, I don't know when, when that report will be ready, but I expect it sometime soon. So, well, thanks, everybody. See you around in um, some...